I stay bout it, I'm not pouting Break through walls and climb it mountains If you want it, scream it loud And show this world what they've been doubting Never waiting on the world to catch up to me Leave it in the rear view I wish that it was up to me The world would never fit Okay, welcome back to the Brain Tainment Show. I'm joined by Blake Worrell Thompson today. And let me assure you guys, uh, we're in for a real treat today. Blake has quickly become a highly sought after uh, performance and lifestyle coach. And after diving into his work recently, it's pretty easy to see why. And I think you'll quickly come to see that too. Having spent the last 17 years finessing his unique and innovative coaching style, Blake provides his clients with the skills to really propel and prosper in their lives forever challenging the status quo and society's norms, which I love. We're just laughing a little bit off air. Um, uh, it allows Blake to really delve into areas many are afraid to explore, which brings with it wisdom, methods, and learnings to go with his radically honest approach. I love his style. I really like his story. Um, I think it's super relatable and powerful. And I know we're going to unpack some really interesting ideas um, today, which is what this show is all about. So I'm excited to dive right in. With that said, mates, uh, welcome to the show, Blake. Thanks for having me, big fella. Well, it's good to have you. Um, before we dive in, mate, first, a quick shout out uh, where it's due to Genoa for connecting us. Um, had him on the show recently. But uh, look, let's, let's start with some context uh, before we dive into some of the nitty gritty stuff. Um, I mentioned what you're up to now, but let's talk about your story. Uh, could you mm. give us maybe just a snapshot of how you end up in this space now where you're working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, you're working with corporates, you're in this lifestyle space, um, but you haven't always been here. How, what does this road look like? Give us the snapshot of um, what that, uh, how that unfolded. Well, mate, um, in my kind of former life, I was a personal trainer for a good 16 years, which um, puts me in the kind of dinosaur category within that industry because there's a lot of turnover. Um, but within the kind of last two to three years my message and interest started to evolve beyond you know the sets reps and steam broccoli and i wanted to have a bigger impact than i was having in the four walls of a gym so my own evolution of personal development for me and from my own kind of pain and struggles you know led me down a path of nlp um and then that kind of opened you know a can of worms you know in terms of understanding human behavior, psychology, you know, the, the box that so many of us fit into in terms of the status quo and the social conditioning, the programming, patterning. Um, and eventually, you know, in probably the last 12 months of my time in the fitness space, or at least running my own business, it really kind of died within me. And that's when I started to transition out, um, you know, through my own kind of struggles and even family struggles around addiction and, and certain patterns that then uh, gave me my passion essentially in, in understanding how to master the mind, get the most out of yourself. Um, and then that's been the catalyst for the last three years as the transition, you know, took a bit of time, but the transition out of the, the fitness space and more into the coaching and lifestyle performance space. So for you, mate, was there, um, cause I think everyone I've had on the show has always got a similar tale in that, you know, really, really heavily involved in the personal development space in that they just want to become better people. Obviously, one, for fulfillment and happiness, and then two, just as a byproduct, it increases your performance and anything you want to do mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so if, for you, mate, was there was there a particular or maybe a set of problems that you were trying to solve for yourself? Um, and then with some of the clients that you work with now, is there common themes with what they present? Are they trying to you know, is, is it a deep level of fulfillment? Are they trying to optimize their performance at work? Like what, are the, what was it for you um, that you were really trying to solve and what are some of the common themes that you see? Mate, the list, the list is long, to be honest, um, in terms of the problems that I had. You know, one of the things um, that I'm really big on is understanding the effects of your upbringing. So there's a, a period called the imprint period, the first seven years, and that really becomes a catalyst for, the path that you're likely to walk. Um, and for most people, it's the path that they will walk. But for, you know, the, the few of us who are interested in changing that path, um, you know, we start to kind of have to work through our shit and, 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 you know, in order to cultivate and create a new path. So, you know, my upbringing was very dysfunctional at best. Um, you know, and I really struggled at school, you know, and, and 
my childhood just, you know, was, was super challenging. And that created a whole bunch of, you know, dysfunctional patterns in my twenties. Um, you know, whole, whole bunch of, you know, bunch of dysfunctional relationships. And it wasn't really until I turned kind of 30 that I started to understand like, fuck, like I'm on autopilot with zero awareness. And if I can't start to navigate these things, I'm just going to keep following the same path. So that's when it started to kick off. Um, and it was a combination. It was the NLP. It was dating, you know, a beautiful girl who was really polar opposites to me and, and me being very ignorant and arrogant and thinking that everything I did was right and everything that she did was wrong. And I started that process and it was, you know, I'd started that process of NLP and then six months later, you know, the, and I saw the writing on the wall when I, when I started NLP, I actually f- filed for bankruptcy in my business and it was a successful business, but what had, what had happened was a combination of, um, really poor awareness, a whole bunch of, you know, horrible patterning and programming and limiting beliefs around money, you know, a whole bunch of ego, just this combination and a clusterfuck. And, you know, once I opened that can of worms and really started to look at my patterning and programming around money, you know, that led me down, down this path that I am now. Um, and it's been, you know, a really big four years in terms of growth, but without that starting point of awareness, mm. you know, you're not likely to, to really transform things quickly. So that was super insightful. And I guess, you know, in terms of what I'm drawing in now, and I think, you know, I know there's an interest for, for you to kind of go down this path as well. I think depending on your own evolution and what stage you're at is will depend on what you're, you're, you're attracting, you know, in terms of, the clientele. So for me at the moment, it's those that are looking at their life and the system, so to speak, and going, well, fuck, this isn't really working for me. You know, and it's not, if you, if you take a, um, you know, a critical thinking approach to it and you take half a step back and you look at it and you go, well, you know, mental illness has never been so bad. Obesity has never been so bad. You know, relationship, you know, divorce, all of these things aren't really working, but yet we're so fixated on following the system and the norm. And I started to question and go, well, there must be a better way. But it, it requires you to really break away from, you know, many call the matrix and take a step back and go, okay, so this isn't working. Why am I following it? But it's so heavily mm. um, bought into the narrative of like, this is how things should look. And then we're getting a number of people now, you know, part of my clientele going, fuck, I'm on the same page as you. Like, this isn't working for me. I want to go down a different approach. So, whether it's a relationship, whether it's mastering their mind, whether it's finding fulfillment, whether it's, um, you know, the combination, it's, it, it's, it's those that I'm attracting, you know, from a clientele point of view at the moment. I love that. Lot, we could unpack so much there, but you mentioned, um, you know, for you, one of the pivotal sort of moments, I suppose, in your life was around that, around that 30 age. Mate, I'm 30. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of the people listen and tune into this show in a similar sort of age bracket. So, um, mm. Yeah, like I've be, I would love to believe that we are completely blank slates at any point in life, but unfortunately we're not. That said, mm-hmm. and we could, you know, we could try on this for hours, I imagine, but the idea of neuroplasticity and all the science is coming out about literally our hardwiring and our ability to change as humans, it's super exciting. But of course, you know, you got to filter that through. Unfortunately, it is a lot easier to change when you are a child. Like it is that imprint um, phase that you mentioned there. So I guess what I'm picking up from you and I get the sort of the core message I like to talk about, I want to encourage and kind of champion, I suppose, is this idea that, yeah, it is fucking harder when you're, in a, when you're older. But I mean, I'll ask you, mate, even at 30, 40, 50, like regardless of age, can we change? Like, can we've talked about limiting beliefs. We'll, we'll expand on this a little bit more throughout, but at its core level, can we actually make those shifts or is it too bad, so sad? Uh, I think 25 years ago, they would have told you that it was um, not possible, but the the whole understanding around neuroplasticity, which for those that don't understand that it's, it's pretty much as it's, as it sounds is, is the brain's ability to be malleable and quite plastic in terms of the way it works. So when you understand how to navigate the brain, um, you understand that it is really possible. And, you know, as I've said you know, earlier, it really does start with a level of awareness. Mm. And one of the challenges for so many of us is, 
is you know so many different elements but that that sense of autopilot you know because if you look at the foundation period where most of us are set up is 95 percent of what we do on a daily basis is unconscious all right so that's the 95 percent that's unconscious where it's serving us unreal don't touch it like brushing your teeth doing your hair putting your shoes on you don't want to bring that to light to make it conscious reprogram and repattern it and then take it back into the unconscious you just leave it but what you want to be able to do is identify the elements that aren't working for you in the unconscious bring them to light work on them and then work on them to a period of time where you get them back into the unconscious and that's your your kind of go-to going forward one of the challenges that many of us have is what's called confirmation bias and what that is is that we will often find evidence to support what we want to believe so if, if i take my example around money you know and at the moment i've got a google sheet and this has been a two and a half three year process of writing down you know limiting beliefs self-sabotage i've got 105 that i've noticed in terms of awareness 105 different levels of habits pattern programming that's not working for me if you've got 105 limiting beliefs or patterns or programming in an area of your life you're fucked like that is a lot so to be able to unpack that when it comes to confirmation bias we'll always find that evidence so mm -hmm. you know one that a lot of people resonate with when i when i share this story is that like money is the root of all evil if you believe that there'll always be evidence to support that you'll find you know billionaires that you know did the wrong thing you'll find um you know endless cases to, to support that. And one of the ones that I give is that if you believe running's bad for you, then you'll be able to find that person at the city to surf that broke their ankle. And in the same year, 97 and a half thousand people completed it. There's evidence to support whatever you want to believe. So one of the challenges for us is to go, okay, that's my current belief system. I'd now ideally in terms of my brain, like to find and have evidence to support otherwise in order to start changing that you know, in conjunction with obviously things like habits, you know, NLP, which is changing, um, you know, from a light hypnosis point of view, changing the way that your brain is structured. There's a number of different ways that you can attack that habit, that patterning, that programming that isn't serving you. Mm. Yeah, it's really encouraging. I couldn't agree more. And like I sort of alluded to, yeah, it can be more challenging as you get older, but um, it is super, super possible, particularly when you have the right strategies. And, and that's sort of the reason behind these conversations and obviously connecting with people like you and the work you do that um, their experience have their own sort of story that they've worked through and, and always experience with other people. It's, it's, this is the starting point, right? It's getting the information and then um, starting to learn the tools and strategies to actually make change, albeit you know, time is a variable. It, it can take time, but um, it can be really, really effective. Um, like I said earlier as well, there's so much to unpack, but in large part, what we're talking about here is to add up to a, to a good life, I suppose, right? A fulfilling life, mm -hmm. at least um, from my perspective. So before we do that, I'd love to know from you, mate, what, what does a good life look like? Um, and it probably varies, but I'd love to get it from your perspective. What does a good life look like? And have you found that there's, pre, there's some foundational um, sort of principles or ideas, I suppose, that are universal that everyone should consider? Yeah, this may sound strange initially until I explain it, but for me, a good life is a life that's on your terms. And the reason I say that is because most people think the life is on their terms, but it's a set of conditioning um, that comes with, you know, what society deems success that you've actually bought into. You've bought into narrative, you've bought into the story of life you know, what success, you know, looks like and you're chasing that. And, you know, one of the terms that I use is that, you know, that if you look at the way society is set up, it dangles the carrot in front of you that, you know, if you just get this house, you'll be happy. If you just get the pay rise, the job promotion, you'll be happier. And people keep chasing that carrot and they get there and it might be 24 hours, it might be a week, it might be a month, you know, you might even post it on social media and you get a few you know, a bit of acknowledgement, you know, you get the little ego boost and then it doesn't quite hit the sweet spot. So you go again, fuck, I must need like a better car, a, you know, a bigger house, a, a more beautiful girlfriend, whatever it may be. And you just keep chasing. And for a lot of people, they never, never get off that hamster wheel. They just keep chasing the carrot that's in front of them. So what I mean by, you know, a good life is a life on your terms is really understanding you on a deeper level and what it is that is, you know, 
in your soul and on a deeper level what it is that you really value. And, you know, once people wake up to that, they'll often find that it's actually not what society deems as success. And Aristotle's got a really good, um, you know, four levels of happiness. And level one and two is very much around money, status, ego, materialism. And those are actually the driving forces for many of us as a society. You know, I need the shinier, happier, bigger, whatever it might be. But in terms of what it looks like for me, if I live my life in alliance with what is true from a values point of view, then I'll always be all right. You know, and 12, 12, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's just come up 12 months, but 12 months ago, I properly bottomed out. You know, like I was starting to get into the coaching space, but I was still on the way down to bottom out before I came back up. And for me, that was a period of time where everything was stripped away from me. Everything that I thought was of value was stripped away. Girlfriend, you know, um, gave me the flick. My car blew up. My job, you know, fell apart. My identity, which was very much around Coach Blake for this period of time, was stripped away from me because I was transitioning, you know, out of the fitness space. Like everything was stripped away. And it was only... You know, speaking of Janara, I was like, fuck, mate, at least I've got my physical and, and mental health. To be fair, my mental health was questionable at that time. Mm-hmm. And then a week later, I actually found myself in hospital with what thought, you know, I thought was meningococcal. And I was like, well, fuck, I can't even rely on my mental, on my physical health. So literally everything was stripped away. And what I noticed at that period of time was like, I then had the tools, even though I was really flat, I had the tools to just kind of get through. And what became clear to me was the things that no one could take away from me. And that's what my values and happiness lied on. And that was my fitness, other than obviously when I bottomed out. If I trained each day, if I ate well, if I was hydrated, I slept well, I got some kind of nature, so sun Mm. or the beach. Um, I connected with someone, like on the blower, because I was in Adelaide and and not many of my closest people were there. And if I did some kind of personal development, because growth is my number one value. Like those, and that's, you know, to be honest, like those things have kept me really good over the last, you know, kind of 12 months. And, you know, you look at obviously what's going on in the world at the moment from, you know, COVID is those things aren't going to be affected by COVID. Right. So while everyone's getting rattled at the moment and, you know, my heart kind of goes out to everyone, especially for you guys in Victoria, because it is really rattling is, Like most of your stuff, your big values won't be external to you. And if you can stay on that, and it doesn't take away from the fact that there's a lot of pressure, especially Mm. financial pressure from people losing jobs um, and, you know, the stress that's put on families and and whatever else. But I had those seven things that that were my anchor points each day. And while I was kind of trying to work out what I was doing with my career in terms of what exactly did the coaching look like, you know, at that point where things were pretty kind of dark, if I tried to entertain the idea of the future, what it looked like, it was, you know, kind of gave me a fair bit of anxiety. I just like, if I can get these seven things done today, I'll reassess tomorrow and get those seven things done and just take it day by day. So that's, you know, we've obviously been coaching and working with a lot of people in Victoria. And that's, that's the one thing, like, how do I win today and Mm. not, you know, get caught up too much in this, the, the unknown of the future. Yeah, I like that, Blake. I like it a lot. It it allows, uh, it's almost like an anti-fragile way to kind of have pillars in your life that add up to fulfillment, right? Because like you touched on nicely there, like it's very hard to take those things away. And I always talk about whether it's a show or just conversations, you know, affair with friends and family. You know, your North Star is ultimately brain chemistry. It's to feel good, right? Um, Mm. And it's so crazy. And we'll talk about this in a moment because I really want to dive into this like societal um societal thing and i'm not like fuck the man kind of like campaigning but um i think it's really powerful conversations to have you know with just to identify firstly some of the crazy constraints society puts on us on our psychology so um you know i got no beef with uh, having nice things and you know i am ambitious and driven by nature but man i think it's i think clarity is really important i think that's what we're talking about isn't it it's like getting really clear on what's the most important thing and then kind of expanding from there like it's kind of pointless going after the nice car, the nice girl or guy, you know, depending on what you're into and um, going after that stuff, if you, everything else is really flaky because it'll just crumble. Um, it's not sustainable. And as you would, as you would, I'm sure confirm given your story. Right. So yeah, uh, I think clarity, like I was saying is really important. Um, this all probably, and you've, you've touched on it a couple of times, this all sort of predisposes that people um, have the ability and willingness to be self-aware 
Um, and then to first take stock and go, fuck, I am chasing the wrong things or maybe I need to pivot or maybe I need to adjust this in my life. So gets a lot of airtime lately, uh, which is amazing, this idea of self-awareness. So <clears throat> I'd love to know a couple of things. One, um, what are the tools and strategies are supposed to start really implementing that into our lives? And two, what do you like? what's the conversation for people that are scared to stare at their inadequacies um, and sort of stare nakedly at, lo- at what's not working if their ego is already quite fragile? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's really mate, really good questions. Um, so the first thing I would say is that whatever you choose to um, hide from isn't going anywhere. So the, the work around this is called shadow work, and, and what it looks like is if you're fixated one way, so duality, but being able to work both ways. If you're fixated on one thing and you're trying to hide the other, it's not going anywhere. So being able to integrate that and integrating in bodies a really big part of, you know, self-development that probably doesn't get enough taught because, Mm. you know, for many of us, there's a real desire for mental masturbation of like, read this, you know, watch this podcast, but where's the actual, you know, integration and implementation of these things. So when you are, um, you know, uh, you've got a level of shame or you're hiding from that other part of you, it's really important to start to create a better relationship with that. So, you know, to give you an example is if you're really, really motivated, and I think that's, you know, one of the best traits that you can have, what, like what's wrong with, you know, having a, a lazy couple of hours on the couch, you know, and what's the stories that you tell yourself? You know, if, if you know, one of the ones I was working with one of the boys last week was in his gym, one of the guys you know, took off his top and he was like, oh, he's mate, his, his rig wasn't quite good enough to get his top off. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, who, who are you to define who can take his top off and who can't? But what we, you know, when we unpacked it was his self-worth was so attached to having a really good physique that he needed, you know, he got to choose to have a better relationship with not being, you know, perfect and, and having all your attachments set to that. So, you know, the shadow work is really healthy from an integration point of view as opposed to the ego part. And the ego is a challenge, you know. I talk about it mainly in a negative context, although there are positives because it's that's the impact it's had on me. It's been very kind of negative. And a book, Ego is the Enemy by um, Ryan Halliday is brilliant in terms of really kind of solidifying the negative impact that it can have. Um, so that's how I would look at that part. I've already forgotten the first part of your question. Well, essentially just it? working out um, what are some of the tools to then um, start identifying where we're falling short or where we're making the wrong decisions. Yeah, this is good. So <clears throat> for many of us, there's a lot of blind spots, um, a lot. And the reason for that is that, you know, one of the really, if you can really get your head around this concept, it's, it's amazing, is you get to choose your reality. So what, what I mean by that is there's not, there's not two people anywhere in the world that have the same reality. And the reason for that is no two people have walked the same path. So because, you know, with a lack of awareness, this is our reality, it's, we often don't question our reality. So one of the things I say is loosen your grip on what you believe to be true if you're going to make change. Because if you hold tight, You'll go with that confirmation bias. You'll keep playing it out. So in terms of, you know, starting to make this transition, one of the things I'd actually probably get you to do is to ask the people around you. Because mm. as, you know, you're, you're moving into this place of awareness, you're going to have a shit ton of blind spots. You know, like, you know, your partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, mum. Well, I probably don't ask your mum, dad, because you are a byproduct of them. So they've probably got the same habits. But those that are observing your world from the outside – it might be worth asking them like, oh, what do you think is a, you know, a limiting belief of mine or what is a you know, pattern or habit that isn't serving me? And they are so easy to make transitions when you're awake to them. Mm. But what I would do as well is because so many of us are in the, in the doing mode, e.g. do, 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 we're very rarely in the being mode. So doing very masculine, being very kind of feminine, And it's often in the being, in reflection, stillness and silence that we get to hear our inner inner dialogue. We get to 
be more aware of what's going on in our body, we get to have that level of introspection where we start to kind of pay attention to what's going on and what's not. And mate, at the end of the day, your results speak the loudest. You know, like if you've got $300 in your account and you keep struggling to pay your bills, probably something happening around money. If your relationships keep falling apart, probably something going on with your relationships. If you're not happy, probably something to look at. Like your result, like it's not an accident. Like mm. the fucking world is telling you a story, dude, this isn't working for you. Like when are you going to wake up? You know, and for a lot of us, unfortunately, it's not the, it's not the whisper. It's not the slap in the face. It's the steam train that has to come through and wipe us like off our mm. ass. That is the wake up call. But if you really start like, listening you know the universe has given you signs all the time that most of us don't hear that whisper so mm. ideally before you really you know before shit really hits the fan try and listen to that whisper as to what's working and what's not for you yeah really good um you mentioned uh i think it was ryan holiday's book the ego's enemy great book Mate, another great book is Lost Connections. And I've heard you talk about reading that um, a couple of times. And I mean, we could probably again riff on that for a long period of time. But one of the major points in that I think you were talking about was the contrast between certain countries as to what the default mode is, I suppose, to drive um, happiness, like what the go-to mechanism, mm. mechanism is to kind of fill a void. And for the Western world in large part, anyway, like Australia, I know is one, one America, um, you know, we, we quickly default to like get things. What can we get? What can we buy? to um, sort of chase that ever elusive feeling of happiness vis-a-vis other countries like Taiwan, I forget where they were, but um, have a different approach. Could you maybe talk about that a bit? Cause I think that's really interesting and um, in line with what we're talking about. Well, part of it kind of comes back to Aristotle's four levels of happiness. And I don't think I mentioned this, but we spoke mm. about it earlier around ego, materialism, status. Um, and the one that I forgot is very much around individualistic. You know, you look at the way our world is set up. It's like, you know, if I get here, if I get this, if I, and it's very much about me. Whereas if you look at, you know, a lot of, yeah, you, you pretty much know that it. it was Australia, US and UK. You know, there's a study around, like, if you're going to um, increase your happiness, what do you do? And, you know, the Western world go out and like do shit for themselves. Taiwan, Denmark and Japan go out and do stuff for others. So, you know, one of the quick and easy ways to um, improve your happiness is to be of service. And, you know, Janelle says the same thing. We, when we both heard to be of service, it felt initially a bit like preaching, a bit kind of weird. But, you know, ultimately, if you look at Aristotle's first two levels, then you look at level three and level four. Level three and level four is very much around passion, purpose, mission, love, like deep connectedness, um, transcendence so transcendence of self and to be of service so if you can ultimately work out what your purpose is and then um give that to the world like you're going to be up and about so to be of service and you know from a genuine place as well and what i mean by that is often in you know relationships is a really obvious place where this stands out is we give to get and if you're giving to get, it's it's not really coming from the right place. So giving without intention to receive, and that's one of the big things for us with momentum and you know where I'm going with my coaching and also this program that I'm launching in 2021 is to be of service to those very much in alignment with you know my beliefs or, or, or my interests. Um, so working out firstly, what is it that really lights you up? And then to be able to kind of serve from that place um is the ultimate and you know i'm sure people realize that you know if they do give you never feel bad for giving so to give more as opposed to you know the self-fulfilling individualist individualistic approach um is going to be a lot more satisfying from a fulfillment point of view man i agree and even if uh, people are listening or watching a simple exercise for trial and error is just like when you finish with this conversation, obviously, then jump on your phone, shoot a text to someone you haven't spoken to in a while, just something kind and you know, wish them a good day. Like it's it's interesting the last sort of six to 12 months, some of the more ethereal, esoteric sort of ideas of um, what, you know, what, what makes you happy. I've really sort of taken on board and it's funny how powerful that can be. So I encourage anyone to just do something little, you know, with no expectation of anything in return. But it's I actually think there's a lot of science that they've done um, on like neurochemistry is like there's more happiness for film, whatever, like 
um, dopamine, serotonin, all the feel-good hormones and neurochemistry that gets released in the in the giver in that situation and there is in the receiver. So even the science is in. Um, just simple things like that is a good place to start. It just makes a better world. It makes the world a better place and, and paradoxically it makes you a happier person as well. Yep. I like that. Uh, hey, Blake, you, you mentioned Momentum there, one of the programs that you're part of. I want to talk about that um, because I think it is a, a shift in the right direction around societal constraints. I've touched on a couple of times. So mm. just to give you a bit of context and for the listeners, they've probably heard me say it a thousand times, but what this show is all about in large part is probably twofold with Brain Tame. And it's one to sort of address, you know, opportunities to optimize and live a more fulfilling life and increase performance and things of that nature on a, on a personal level. And I know you do one-on-one coaching and things of that nature, but I think the harder part is sort of the longer term vision of what I'm doing. And I think, well, I'm, I won't put words in your mouth, but from what I see from you, mate, is uh, helping to penetrate uh, culture, I suppose. And that's something I've become like just insanely passionate about is this idea of how do we make these sort of conversations that we're having, how do we make them the norm? How do we make them sexy and cool so that this is just what you do? We want to optimize. We want to feel good. We want to be vulnerable where it makes sense to be and just make it just the norm, right? And I think that uh, certainly um, in the women's space have their own constraints and challenges, but being a man myself, I can speak more freely about... um, societal norms i suppose so talk to me about momentum what it's all about and what the mission is there well mate you you know as you said you you pretty much nailed it for for i mean it's come you know momentum's come together from a kind of number of different angles but essentially you look at the men's space and you know it's really struggling to cater at this stage to the average aussie bloke you know, you've got those with the psychologist and that approach, you've got those that, you know, more spiritual and kind of barefoot hugging and eye gazing and, and those type of exercises. And I've been fortunate enough to kind of, you know, get along and have friends at both ends. But if you're looking at the, the big chunk of blokes in the middle, you know, probably the 90, 95%, there's, there hasn't really been an avenue for them to um, have a conversation and, you know, whether it's a conversation over a beer, whether it's a conversation with a footy, in, you know, on or whatever it might be, is there hasn't been an appealing, accessible, attainable option for blokes. Like if you look at the way um, people look about, you know, at men's work at the moment, it's still got, a you know, a pretty cringy stigma to it. So when we looked at it, we're like, okay, so how do we make this more appealing and accessible? Because for a lot of blokes you know, if they're going to start to make a movement, well, they're going to dip their toe in. And a lot of stuff that's out there isn't perfect for beginners. You know, and it might be a conversation where you ask a question just one level deeper. So, you know, for us, another part of that was like, we want to be surrounded by blokes who are happy to have a deeper chat. You know, like gone for me anyway, gone are the days where I'd go to a pub and, you know, talk to a mate and it'd be like, how's your week? Good. How's your girlfriend good how you good and like that would be the comments like i might as well go to bed like Mm. i'm tired after that conversation and what i noticed is that you know if you can approach it the right way like blokes will be open to it but it might be that you've got to dip your toe in slowly so for example you know how's your missus good oh mate i heard she got a a new job three months ago how's she holding up like even that is just one step forward and it's enough to create a little bit more connection than you might've had previously. So we looked at it and, you know, the way that we look at the men's space now is it's slowly waking up, obviously, you know, a long way behind, you know, women and and their natural tendency to communicate and connect and talk for hours Mm. about anything. But, you know, we look at it and go, well, you know, for us, the men's space is where, you know, online dating was seven years ago. People were starting to do it, but it wasn't the norm. And, you know, people were kind of still quietly going about their business. And that's probably where we are, you know, as a collective. Um, and I'd say it's probably three to five years away from normalising it and blokes just doing the work. And similar to what you said, you know, when blokes come to us with momentum, they can they can be anywhere between pain, like really struggling. And we actually got a psychologist on board because we're not kind of equipped to deal with those, you know, that are real kind of in the dark to performance. Those who just want to mask their mind, you know, be better from a relationship point of view, be better sexually, you know, you know, get themselves more in terms of optimizing their, their health and fitness. So 
anywhere along that um, path for blokes who are kind of looking just to dip their toe in for the first time, um, we feel like we're, you know, a good avenue for those guys. Yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm, I'd love to see what comes of that over the next couple of years. I know, um, if I'm not mistaken, you've got a couple of other guys involved in the project that, um, you know, that I'll be connecting with which is on the show, which is exciting. But, uh, yeah, look, I, I like to talk about um, sort of moving forward or advancing in, any, in whatever that looks like for you in three ways. One's through the mind directly, which is, you know, um, can be more sort of um, – uh, intangible, but super powerful, obviously. Another way is through the body and having spent so much time in fitness, you'd be well aware. Um, and then a third way is just to environment. And that's, you know, that's nature. It's good people. You know, the whole, the old adage of you mm. are the sum of the five people you spend time with, you know, it's a cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. It's pretty true. So um, I suppose that's, I imagine part of the idea with momentum and a lot of the work that you do is just creating the right environment Um so, so you can then have the conversations around what to do with your body, what to do with your mind. But it, I reckon the environment is an overlooked part. Um, and I've heard you talk about as well, the move you made up. Uh, were you originally from Melbourne, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, yep. you moved up. And are you in Byron now? Is that where you are? Or? Yeah, I'm in Byron. You're in Byron. Yeah, yeah, I thought you were. I yeah, remember yeah, chatting with Jenna. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I've heard you talk about making that move and the impact that that had. Could you maybe mm. share some thoughts around um, how environments played a role for you and um, yeah, just its, it's benefits in general. Well, mate, the, you know, one of the real um, struggles that I think we're about to experience, I, I, we, to be honest, we are experiencing now, but most people don't realise is a sense of loneliness. Mm. And, you know, for me, that's the next e epidemic and we're going to get hit pretty hard with it. Um, and, you know, when I, was, when I was in my struggle, I went to Melbourne for, must have been about nine months, once I shut down my fitness business in Sydney, is you know, to go through that period of struggle was hard, like really hard, but to go through it and not feeling like I was massively connected um, to my partner, to those people in Melbourne that I was friends with and those to kind of my other friends was even more challenging. And, you know, you, you can't shift the responsibility, like a big part of that weighed on me um, in terms of not necessarily reaching out. And, and you know, to be honest, a, a big part weighed on people that just didn't have the skills to know how to manage someone who was really flat. So, you know, the environment for me is, is everything. Um, and, you know, even looking at this project I'm creating 2021 called Tribe is very much like-minded people. You know, like there's a, there's, a, there's a difference when it comes to loneliness of a room full of people and a room full of people that you really connect with, you know, and, the, and, and connection rapport um, is created in, you know, having something mutually of interest as opposed to one person talking or whatever it might be. And, you know, many people that are listening probably have experienced this at some stage. It's like I've been in a relationship lying next to um, my partner, but feeling a thousand miles away from them. Like it doesn't matter if it's two people or a hundred people, it's that level of connection and that level of depth that comes in that connection that really um, is a catalyst for the right environment. So for me now, you know, that's, that's just what I live for. Like, you know, having a conversation with you now, like this is the type of stuff I live for, you know, I just can't do. And, and respectfully, I just mm. can't do like, you know, boring stuff. I mean, I can still talk to mates for about footy for, three hours especially yep. when the when the d's are playing well which is once a decade but like you know though and those are still of, of value but i'm really interested in real strong connections with people um and knowing their story and knowing you know what they might be struggling with and, and creating a safe container you know that's a big thing because if you look at it from a deep level of trust like you know often unfortunately in, in friendships and whatever, there's there's an element of comparing or competing. Yep. And that doesn't create this safe container for being able to be, you know, really kind of vulnerable and transparent in what you've got to say. You know, we've got this, you know, ego part of us that really, you know, oh, that person's struggling and, and kind of feeling, you know, good, good about that, which is a really unhealthy um, trait. So the safe container, the, the level of depth and connection, um, you know, is really what I'm drawn to these days from an environmental point of view. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I agree so uh, viciously with that 
Blake, uh, oh, I love great conversations. I reckon it's probably twofold. One is you just learn, which, you know, I'm trying to be an advocate and almost the poster boy for, just continually learning. And that has a whole slew of, of, you know, positive benefits. But then two, it's this deeper sense of connection. And, you know, mm. you, we all know it intrinsically if you really sort of marinate in that idea. But, like, we're, we're literally hardwired for connection. We're a social creature. You know, we're not like, I can't even think of an example, but some animals are just literally wired to be, isolated it's just their, that's their mm. shtick it's that is so polar opposite to the way humans are wide and I, I really agree that this idea of loneliness is potentially becoming a big sort of global concern um, mm. and even just I can just speak to that a little bit just with being in isolation I've worked for myself for the last couple of years and you know probably more than most I'm extremely social I love you know connecting with people so just stripping that way a little bit like you notice the impact dramatically so um, I hope people listening really take that seriously. And it is, it's not just, I, mean, I like how you expanded on that idea in more detail. It's not just a matter of just connecting and saying, Hey, what's up? Good, good, good. How are you? Good. That doesn't, it's not about ticking a box. It's about really having that sense of connection that kind of intrinsically mm. lights us up inside. So, um, and part of it is practice, right? Like it's a skill set, like anything is being able to ask the right questions, being able to be vulnerable to sort of create the right environment, the right space for people, particularly if they're not as, you know, maybe they haven't built the skill set of, of sharing so freely. Mm. So yeah, it's a bit of a nuance, bit of a dance. Um, but I think we've got to, you know, I, I hope that as a society, we move in the direction of um, getting better anyway. Yep, mate, it's big. And, and it's, you know, that, that you, you make some really good points around developing the skill of asking the right questions. Um, and that can take some time. Mm. And what I'll say with that is the more present you are, the more that will come naturally as well. Like if you've got this fixated idea of, you know, how this conversation is going to play out, then mm. you're not really present. And it's listening with the intent to understand, not necessarily listening with the intent to speak, because, you know, if you, if you watch many people in dialogue, it's very much like they're almost waiting till the other person stops so they can speak as opposed to being really present, really paying attention to the conversation that's unfolding and then guiding it that way. And that's one of the big things, you know, that I personally like when I do a podcast with someone is I don't, you know, I want it to be, personally for me it's a lot more enjoyable when it's a conversation as opposed yep. to um you know fixated on these certain questions and it having nothing to do with how i just rounded out the last question like letting it kind of unfold a bit is um for me a much more natural uh you know podcast or interview as well yeah that's where i get the most value and i'm like i'm a fiend for podcasts you know i could list a whole host of names and the ones i like are generally more conversational you know there's structure and there's mm. real value to take from it but it's it's kind of back and forth and you're kind of just sitting like a fly on the wall. Um, and hopefully that people get that vibe from, you know, this show. And um, I, I, admittedly, I've had feedback that that's what people have liked about my style. And I've got, you know, worlds to go in terms of building my skill set of hosting good conversations. But um, in large part, look, you know, full disclosure, I am very much a people person. I'm an extrovert mm. by nature. So compared to some, it, it does come a little bit easier. Absolutely. Um but the secret source is really just coming from a place of curiosity. It's like, I'm just fucking mm. interested in your story, Blake. Like I want to pick your brain, kind of extract as much value as I can personally. And then, you know, as a byproduct, awesome if someone else gets some value. So that's sort of the, to that point you just mentioned, that's sort of the the secret source for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've spoken about limiting beliefs. I really, I want to go a bit harder on that because I think that's really powerful. So for some of the people that you've worked with, Blake, what are some common themes that you've seen there? Um, like you've touched on a couple for yourself, but sort of, I guess, more universally across um, society, society, men and women alike. Mm. Um, let's list a few. Like what are some limiting beliefs that you've seen as um, holding people back? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's societal beliefs from from male and female and obviously working with different um, uh, genders. You know, some of the male ones are... Um, feeling like they can't have it all. So they can be good at health or they can be good at fitness or they can be good at relationship, but not being able to kind of navigate all of them. There's a lot for female around um, sexuality, like really, you know, and it starts at such a young age and, and males have it as well. But, you know, I guess the female clients that I work with, you know, the limiting beliefs start, you know, when your parents are like, oh, wash your body and wash your bits, you know, you start creating that disassociation at such a young age. And then the kind of slut shaming that happens with, the, you know, the freedom and, liberating you know females in their teens and then you know societal constraints around what's appropriate and what's not which is 
absolute bullshit. So they often create a disassociation with their truest expression of self from a sexuality point of view. Um, and then, you know, in terms of males, you know, one of the big and females actually is that, you know, and this is off, actually passed down from the generation before is that like, you, you, you should just do your job. Like, it shouldn't necessarily be about happiness or whatever. And generationally that makes sense because the generation before our parents was part of the great depression. So, you know, what was important to, for them to filter down to their kids, e.g. our parents was, you know, stability and safety is really important because they didn't have that during the great depression. So while our parents generation, you know, might've spent 30, 40, 50 years doing the same job and being fucking bored out of their mind, but at least they had stability and safety they've tried to instill that on us. Whereas like, you know, for me, that's bullshit. Like we, our generation is all around finding that passion and purpose, not, not necessarily, we're not as big on stability and safety um, as they were, but we can also have a, you know, have things grow really quickly, obviously with the kind of entrepreneurship and, you know, ability to blow up your business really quickly. So there's a couple, mm. um, and then just the confidence to do whatever you want to do, you know, like whether it's run a marathon, whether it's, um, you know, find the person, like person of your dreams, whatever it may be, is there some deeply ingrained stuff mm. that's really having a massive impact, um, which I love unpacking for them and, and love seeing them kind of flourish um, and have, you know, a more fulfilling life that ultimately, you know, feels right to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think this idea of learning beliefs is sort of one one well big part in this like um, sort of more broader concept of identity. I think mm. you agree of like how you, my story of myself, you everyone's the same. Like our our self narrative is ultimately well for the most part what dictates our decision making, our behaviours, and ultimately you know how our life plays out. Like I think I, I remember reading some science on this human drive to act in congruence with how we see ourselves. Mm. Um, there's another quote as well I really like just to sort of digress a little bit. I think it was Jay Shetty. I'm not, if you, not sure if you listen to much of his stuff, but yeah, uh, he's awesome. So anyway, he, I heard him talk on a podcast, this idea of uh, I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So that's another sort of um, variable yeah. that plays into it as well is like, which means that we operate differently in different circles. And then that sort of like mismatch between, you know, showing up one way and showing up another way. Anyway, I'm sort of riffing on, I'm um, getting myself confused a little bit, but um, I think that idea of self narrative is, is insanely powerful, um, but super fascinating how we like, we show up in a way that is congruent with how we view ourselves. Um, yeah. So until that changes and that's the reason mm. at its core level, I think for these sort of conversations it becomes really tangible because um, unless you change that, like any behavioral change is going to not be sustainable. It's going to, you're going to fall back on, you know, it's the same way that like you hear people who make a lot of money in the lotto um, and then they're broken here. Yeah. Like the stats on that are fucking insane. Like I actually looked it up the other day um, and it's in large part because we act in congruence with, you know, who we see ourselves to be. So um, is that something you agree with? And like, where do we go from there? Like how do we sort of, how do we fix that? Yeah, it's spot on. I think it's 97% of a uh, lot of winners go bankrupt within or, or lose all their money within like three to five years. You've probably got it if you've looked at it recently. Mm. But if you haven't changed your identity and your programming around money, then you will find a way to fuck it up. So the be, do, have is really interesting um, in order to um, who do I have to be in order, and what do I have to do in order to have what it is. So changing your psychology from a B point of view, it's a really good exercise that's super effective. And you're right in saying that like on a deep level, it's the identity shift that um, needs to change. And that can be really challenging because mm. what we're actually programmed to do is stay with what's familiar. So even if what is familiar isn't good, our system works with that. So say, for example, if you were growing up, you had really, um, you know, toxic uh, relationship dynamic between your parents. Is your 
on an identity and on a kind of cellular DNA level is your body becomes wired for that. E.g., this really disruptive, unhealthy, your body knows that best. So it's likely that if you've got something like that happening um, on a deep level, that you will attract that through later through life until you start to question um, and choose otherwise. But knowing that if you choose otherwise and you've got this smooth sailing, really happy relationship, that will throw homeostasis, so, you, so your body's um, balance, out initially because you're not wired for that. So that can be really challenging in that we choose familiar or what's mm. familiar over what's better for us because that's what our system kind of recognizes and knows. So mm. yeah, it has its challenges for sure. It's like that just taking the path of least resistance, right? Is yep. um, like you said, yeah, that's really interesting. We just get stuck in, it's like you need um, the, the drive to want to shift. And sometimes it like, I think you actually touched on it. Like sometimes you need to hit rock bottom Uh, unfortunately, because it's a powerful enough catalyst to make change. So I think it's this idea of, um, you know, like you need something more powerful than your reptilian brain wants to just chill (laughs) yeah, Uh, and sort of conserve calories. Like you need something more Mm. powerful than that to kind of put you into action and then filter that through the time variable. So you actually start changing neural pathways. Obviously it's it's very nuanced and, you know, we're just unpacking a small part of it, but, um, you got to start somewhere, right? Otherwise, this identity is just going to be self-fulfilling. Well, yeah, and, and, the, and the part for that is that when the pain to change is less than the pain of staying the same, that's when most people will change. So unfortunately, that's, that's the level that it needs to get to for many people before they make that change. So then this is a good little segue into the last little bit of this chat, man. I really appreciate you, you know, carving out the time. And again, I've sort of joked on a couple of times. I reckon we could talk for hours um, is the work that you do with your clients. I know you, um, well, I don't, I actually don't know a hundred percent about the different um, options you have for people to connect with you. So I want to talk about that a bit, you know, opportunity to give yourself a free plug, no shame. Um, but, <laughs> but I'm actually really interested because uh, I, I've touched on all the different podcasts that I listen to, mm. books I read, sort of this world of self-improvement. And I encourage anyone listening to do the same, fall in love with learning. Mm. What I talk about a lot is being able to filter that. So not every piece of advice is going to be applicable for you because there are con- contradicting ideas. And particularly mm. in like the diet and for fitness space, as you would well know, but the same with personal development. So hopefully what we've shared today is added value, but maybe just filter that through what, you know, what makes sense for you and start to build your own um, personal philosophy. But what I wanted to ask, mate, is books and podcasts are one way and it sort of gets you on the journey. But we've spoken about the importance of environment and people around Mm. you. I imagine that's in large part the real value of connecting with a coach, connecting with someone who knows what they're doing, who um, has experience working with clients to kind of help navigate through that process. So could you, from a curiosity point of view, could you talk a bit Mm. more in detail about what you offer and um, how you go about working with people? Yeah, well, like firstly, you know, whenever I round out a podcast and we we get to this question, one of the things that I always reinforce is that you need to find the the best fit for you. You know, a lot of us that are on that self-development path are very quick to jump onto the next thing um, and, and jump around. So, you know, whether it's with me, whether it's whoever it's with, it's worth just kind of getting a feel for how they go about things and, and knowing if, you know, you guys will click and whether you're a good fit together. So that's kind of, mm. you know, a, a really important part for me in terms of what I do. It, it depends who, you know, comes to me and, and what it is that they're after, but essentially, you know, I'm a big believer that it starts with self-awareness. So with, you know, a number of different tools a, a, a number of different modalities and a number of kind of, assessment so to speak we really heighten and help people understand themselves what conditioning they've got you know that's stopping them from having kind of more success more fulfillment and then take them on a path to kind of you know success and fulfillment whatever that looks like to to them so you know in terms of mastering the mind getting them really in touch with their kind of truest um, most authentic expression of self is really important and that can be challenging when you are you know, conditioned by all of the restraints that society puts on you and that you've put on yourself to really start to unpack that. So, you know, women have come to me 
a lot. You know, I've got kind of um, qualifications in relationship through the Gottman Institute as well, mm. which is an amazing group um, based in the US. So if they're trying to navigate their relationship, which, you know, it's such a big investment of um, time, energy um, and our life that you, you kind of want to get it fulfilling and, and happy. Um, and then, you know, so there's that part then, you know, for many of them, it's kind of understanding how to master their mind and master themselves to get the most out of them. So mm. that's where we're drawn to. And, you know, momentum's obviously for men looking to kind of start to do the work, you know, where we kind of challenge and champion men to be better versions of themselves. And then, you know, tribe is the final piece for me that I'm creating for 2021, which is very much around the like-minded people who, um, you know, for, for many of them feel kind of alone in this journey mm -hmm. of personal development, might feel, you know, alone in, in wanting to explore sexuality and understand their relationships better. You know, even someone like yourself, there's a, there's a group that I've peeled off with business, um, you know, people, business owners and entrepreneurs and, and having that accountability, advice, structure, support is really important in terms of, you know, getting the most out of yourself. So, um those are the the avenues but as i said you really want to make sure it's a fit for both people um you know and i kind of think of business these days as people to people as opposed to business to business like yeah. you really want to have that feel right for you you know if you're going to jump into something i agree yeah well man i i love your approach so i'd encourage anyone listening to at least connect with you um uh, and we'll have to get you back on the show mate when you've got tribe up and about and we can talk more about that and continue this conversation um but where can people connect with you is it if you got a website socials how do we find you probably best socials where i do most of my work like most people these days so blake warrell thompson b-l-a-k-e-w-o-r-r-a-l-l-t-h-o-m-p-s-o-n that's my instagram and that's probably where most stuff happens and you'll get a feel there if it's a if it's a good fit but hopefully you get plenty of juice with the, the stuff i put out anyway Awesome, mate. I'll see if I can get my tech guys to put it up on screen when we um, when we go live. Uh, well, yeah, like I said, really appreciate you coming at the time, Blake. Awesome to connect. Um, you know, I think I learned heaps, which is which is pillar number one that I want from these conversations. So hopefully someone listening or watching gets some value too, which I'm sure they did. Beautiful, mate. Thanks very much for having me on.